Awesome. Um, well, thanks for coming today. We are fortunate to be joined by Rebecca London, who's a faculty member at UC San Bruce. Um, her research focuses on understanding the challenges faced by disadvantaged children and youth in ways that communities and community organizations support people to be healthy and successful across the lifespan. Um, so tons of experience in multiple fields, from public policy to health to education. Um, she's been funded by the William T. Grant Foundation, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the U.S. Department of Education. Her most recent project, which is kind of on the screen, but also here, was a compilation of um, all of the latest and greatest recess research. Um, and so rethinking recess, being safe and inclusive playtime for all children in schools, it is the topic of today's talk. Um, book is also available. We have like three or four lab copies if you ever want to borrow it and take a look. Feel free. Um, but with that, um, please join me in welcoming Rebecca. Hi everyone. I feel like I'm um, in my um, my lecture. Uh, it's like the whole front row and I'm doing everyone's in the back. But this is being taped, so I feel like I'm supposed to stand kind of up here. Um, so thank you. Um, thanks for inviting me. It's really a pleasure to be here. I've, ex I've um, experienced the whole range of Oregon weather, even just today, which is lovely. Um, I'm enjoying it. It's not raining where I live um, right now, so it's kind of nice to have a little bit of precipitation. Um, and um, so when I, um, I, this book just came out in October, and I've been kind of talking around the country, and the first question I always get when I go to talk about my research is, why do you study elementary school recess? Um, and in fact, I was meeting with my um, doctoral advisor a couple years ago, and I was telling her, oh, I'm doing all this work on recess, and she was like, really? Like, recess? Of all the things you could study related to policy, you picked recess? Like, isn't that the one time of the day that's going really well? And I was like, well, you know, actually, it's not the one time of the day that's going really well, um, and we need to do a lot of work on it. So um, my interest in recess really has to do with the, um, the like, whole child space that it occupies in the school day. So my background is in human development and social policy. That's what my PhD is in. And it's an interdisciplinary PhD. The idea behind it is that you can't possibly make good public policy for children especially, unless you understand where they are developmentally. So if you're not thinking about children's development, you might come up with policies that, for instance, have them sitting in their seats for eight hours at a time, right? Not understanding that that is not a good way to teach young children because they can't possibly learn if they're sitting in the same place for eight hours straight. Um, and so when I think about recess, I think about it as this opportunity for us to embed all the things that we know children need in order to grow up healthy and successful Things like um, their social and emotional skills that have to be built, healthy bodies, healthy minds, ability to interact with others. All those things are happening at recess, and yet it's the time of day that almost nobody's paying attention to, except for maybe a few people in this room um, and me. And so um, that was really, that's really my interest in this topic, to elevate the importance of this time during the school day and to bring um, some intentionality to the way we're thinking about recess um, as an education professional. So, so um, I know you guys all know Will Massey studies recess too. We've collaborated with the same organization, Playworks, a fair amount. Um, our, our research is very much aligned. Um, I come at it a little bit more from a school policy perspective, um, and he's really coming at it a little bit more from like a measurement um, and like quality perspective. And so I think those fit nicely together, and um, I use his research all the time in my work. It's been incredibly helpful. So why, why should we care about recess? Um, I use this term whole child development. This is something they say in education. And when they say whole child, what they're referring to are the developmental areas that children go through, right? So children's development has been categorized into um, like intellectual, social, emotional, and physical. Those are the four ways that people think about child development. Um, and so in terms of health, I mean, Recess is the time of the day where children have some unregulated space to get physical activity. The American Academy of Pediatrics says they should be getting 60 minutes um, per day, and this could be some of those minutes. It's not necessarily just by providing them those minutes. doesn't mean they're using it all for physical activity, but it could be. 
Um, and in fact, we do know, this is, um, I think, from Will's research, 27% of physical activity in the school day does happen at recess. So it is a time where they're getting a fair amount of activity, or they could be getting that activity. Um, so, but it's not just about meeting those minutes. We know that children, also adults, I mean, everybody needs a break during their day, right? Like, you need a break, I need a break, you have to get a coffee, you gotta stand up, relax, move your legs around. You know, when you get moving, it sort of makes you, it's easier to refocus and to think a little bit. We know that movement actually changes the way that cognition works, um, and it helps children to focus, and it helps them to be able to pay attention. And so that time, that break in the middle of the day, or maybe even two breaks in the middle of the day, is really important for their academic learning also. That health benefit translates into one of the other developmental areas um, in terms of their academics. The other developmental area that's really, really important is um, what educators are calling social and emotional learning. Um, there's actually now, if you're familiar with education policies, social and emotional learning, or SEL as they're calling it, has become one of the key interventions that schools are now using to help with academic success. And there are curricula, there's been a lot of research on this topic. We know a lot about the ways that social and emotional learning can help children to develop in their academic lives. Um, but this all happens, all of these things are happening inside the classroom, which is a fairly regulated space, right? There's a teacher and a lesson, and children aren't really having the time to practice any of those skills during that time in an unregulated way where they're really put to the test until they get to recess. And once they get to recess, then they can say, they can sort of pull on that self-regulation. I didn't win the game that I thought I was supposed to win, and it was unfair the way it all came down. But can I keep it together and hold my emotions in so that I can go and play another game of tetherball, and maybe this time I'll win, right? That's what the social and emotional learning is about. It's about self-regulation, it's about empathy, it's about conflict resolution, it's about teamwork, it's about building relationships. And if we're not allowing children to do these things at recess, when in the school day are they ever going to have an opportunity to practice these, these important skills? Um, and we know, we know that these are the skills that the, you know, all the research on 21st century uh, workplace skills are these skills. Anything that you need to be a civil society, engage in civil discourse, have a debate, a civil debate where you can actually hear somebody else's opinion, rely on these skills, right? And so these skills are incredibly important for children to be able to develop and master and practice and yet when we think about teaching them in school, we are not thinking about recess, which is a huge mistake. Um, and then finally, play itself. I mean, you know, schools are not thinking about play as an important learning um, opportunity, but play is how children learn. Play is incredibly important for children um, in their learning, and it's so important that the 1989 UN Convention on the Rights of the Child identifies play um, as one of the, as the right of children, I think it was really meant for like child labor laws, but still it's identified by the UN as a right of children. Um, and almost any education organization you can think of and health education, the National Association of the Education of Young Children, NIAC, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the CDC, they all have policy statements on the importance of recess and play. Um, and yet we still have a number of problems with recess. So my goals for this book were threefold, um, and I hope I accomplished them. The first was to document what was happening in recess in low-income urban communities. Those were the communities that I was studying, low-income urban communities, and I'll tell you why in a second. Um, and I was trying to think about, through all the research that I've done, um, trying to document and put in kind of legible terms um, all the ways that we could make recess better to organize recess and make it function better for students um, and adults. And then to think about policy and what policy supports we need in order to um, make recess equitably available and make it, um, make it uh, what it's supposed to be doing for children. So I'm not gonna talk a ton about the data and analysis methods, but if you have questions about this, and I should say if you have questions at any time, feel free to raise your hand and I'm happy to answer them. Um, 
But I'm not going to talk a ton about the data and the methods, but the research was um, based on several different studies, qualitative and quantitative. Um, I did three large qualitative projects with the um, organization Playworks over time. One of them happened to be a randomized controlled trial. Um, so I had control groups, schools that didn't get the treatment, which was a recess intervention, and then treatment group, which did get the resource and recess intervention. Um, there was a couple other qualitative studies that I did in different schools around the country. In total, I think it was in 42 schools around the country. Um, and there was a survey that was done by the Robert Johnson Foundation and the Gallup and Gallup public, um, a public poll, and um, they were um, gracious enough to give me that data. So I did a reanalysis of um, that data. It was a survey of principles about recess. And um, I did some policy analyses that were informed by there's some um, policy materials out there that were done um, in 2016-17, I believe, by the CDC with Shape America. So Shape America is the Society for Health and um, Physical Educators. Um, and so they put out these really great policy materials state by state, and I kind of did an analysis of those. Um, so all this research was done in teams. We had you know, important things like integrated reliability, and, um, and we did a lot of coding and analysis. And I'm not really going to go into that, but if you have questions about how we did that as a team, I'm happy to answer them. OK. So there are three problems. Um, and this is how I'm going to organize the rest of the talk, talking about these three problems. There are three problems with recess today. The first problem is what we call an opportunity gap. So when we talk about children, we talk about education, we talk about achievement gaps, right? We talk about achievement gaps. Some children are doing better than other children. But I reframe it as an opportunity gap because some children have more opportunity to succeed than other children, right? It's not about the child. It's about the context. It's about the institution, the school. And so when we have a recess opportunity gap, what we're saying is some children have access to recess and some do not. Some have access to high quality recess and some do not. And to document that gap is really important. And I haven't seen it done really anywhere else because I'll tell you in a minute, there's really almost no data on this topic. The second is about withholding recess. The most common elementary school punishment is recess withholding. It's the most commonly used. Um, and again, we don't know that much about it, but I will tell you everything I know when we get to that slide. Um, and then the third is that even when it exists, it needs some attention and organization to make it safe and healthy and inclusive. Um, and so I'm going to end with that. Once we get to recess, once we have it, how do we make it work for everybody? So the first one is access. So I'm going to tell you a story. This is a quote from the New York Times in 1998. And it says, we are intent on improving academic performance. You don't do that by having kids hanging on the monkey bars. This was the superintendent of Atlanta Public Schools. This poor man has been vilified over and over and over again. This is one of everybody who studies recess's favorite quotes um, because this was at the time, he made this comment to New York Times, and he was eliminating recess in Atlanta public schools. Um, same thing happened in Baltimore. The same thing happened in Chicago. Chicago public schools didn't have recess for two decades. During that time, schools were built without outdoor play spaces. Right. So what did these schools have in common, all these districts and these schools? What kinds of kids were they serving in these inner city districts? They were serving low-income black and brown children. And in those schools, the children were struggling to meet the academic standards that were being set before them. Now, was that entirely the fault of the children? Probably not, no. We know that most of the achievement gap actually has to do with stuff that are not within the school, like economic status, like you know, single parent families, like health, in, you know, disparities in health, and all kinds of other problems that are also present in low income communities. Um, but because these schools were being held accountable at that time, this is right when No Child Left Behind came in, and we had this whole new standard, standardized testing accountability system coming in. The thought was the way to get kids to do better on tests is to make them sit longer. We need to have more instruction in math and more instruction in English, and we're going to get our test scores up and we'll be better off. And so they cut art, they cut music, they cut science, and they cut recess. Now there's been kind of an outcry about art and music. I'm sure you heard about that. There has not been the same outcry about recess. And what happens when you cut, these, when you cut this time, even if you bring it back, 
this culture of understanding that recess is important gets lost. So these districts have all brought recess back now. They've all brought it back to certain degrees of success. Um, and it's because the teachers are no longer familiar with using recess as a time to help their children succeed. So I wish I had like really, really great data on this. I don't. I'm offering you two views on what I see as the recess opportunity gap. The one on the left is individual students. The one on the right is schools. So the one on the right is from that Robert Wood Johnson Foundation principal survey. That was in 2010. The one on the left was a paper that was published in um, a medical journal. I can't remember which one. I think the data are from like 2003, 4, and they did a survey of third graders, right? So each of these is a sample. There's like not more than 1,000 or 1,500 in each one. We do not have this data nationwide. Nobody is collecting this information in a way that we can disaggregate it to check out our gaps here. The CDC does have some surveys that it collects, but they're not collected annually, and you're not able to disaggregate by, um, by ethnicity or income status. So we really don't have information on this, but what we do have demonstrates exactly what I've just told you, which is that children who are living in low-income um, urban communities or those who are African-American or Latinx have less access to recess than other children. So if you, look at the, if you look at the bar on the left, the, uh, the graph on the left, the kind of pinky red one is that they have regular recess, and the kind of bluey teal one is that they, don't, they have minimal or no recess. And you can see that 77% of um, white children are in schools that have regular recess, whereas only 41% of African American children are in schools that have regular recess. That's shocking. I mean, we should not, that is shocking, 41% of African-American children are in schools with regular recess, less than half, right? That's horrifying to think about. Um, and the same in urban and low-income schools. Um, so this was a little bit more specified. Every day, 30 minutes or more. Every day, less than 30 minutes or not every day. In urban, low-income schools, um, the um, only 28% have more than 30 minutes of recess every day, whereas in all the other schools that they were looking, it was more like 44%. So these schools may be scheduling recess, but they may not be scheduling it for as many minutes, and they may not be scheduling it every single day. So maybe it's once a day for 20 minutes as opposed to twice a day for 20 minutes, or maybe it's three times a week. Um, some schools I've heard they have small play yards, they rotate recess, so you get recess a couple days so that classes can rotate in and out. Um, so anyway, I hope I've convinced you that there is actually this inequity exists. Does anybody need to be convinced even more? No. OK. So we're all on the same page. It exists. So what's, what are we doing about it? There's been actually a policy push, which I think is fascinating. There's been a policy push at the state level to do something about recess and physical activity. So this is not about physical education. I understand Oregon has some new PE um, laws on the books that require a certain number of minutes of PE. This is not that. This is about physical activity minutes. So one of the things that happened with recess is it got, um, it got on the radar of public health advocates who are saying we really need this physical activity time during the day for kids. They're not really thinking about all the other benefits. They're thinking about physical activity, so they're talking about minutes. So this um, map shows you the kind of red, purpley, this one is that recess is required, and the blue one says that there are physical activity minutes required. So in these states, um, the purpley ones, those are the states that currently have on the books a law that says you must have recess, and most of them say it should be about 20 minutes. Um, and then the blue ones say you need to have physical activity time. Again, it kind of works out to about 20 minutes a day. So it doesn't preclude recess, but it doesn't actually say it has to be recess. It just says you have to have time for physical activity that's not PE class. So there's movement. So in Georgia, so I showed you that Atlanta quote, in Georgia they brought recess back and there was a huge parent advocacy push to get recess um, on the legislative books. And two years ago it made it all the way up to the legislature and their session ended before they could vote on it. So then it came back, it came back again on the docket and um, it was approved by the it was, I think, approved by both houses and then um, not signed by the governor. And so they, Georgia did not get their recess law, not yet. I think the advocates are going to continue to fight for that. 
Um, and so, you know, what's happening in all these other states is um, not a whole lot. And even in the states that now have laws, it's really just about minutes. And they're not saying we have to worry about what's happening during the time. It doesn't come with any funding. It doesn't come with any standards or any curricula. There's no goals for what we're getting out of recess. It's really just about if we have those minutes out there, then the kids are going to get a great you know, education. They're going to have time to blow off some steam. And that's kind of the end of the story. And even in these states, I would say we need to push a little harder to get a little bit more on the books. Minutes alone is not enough. Um, and what else do we need? And I'll get there in a minute. But um, right now, we're just really focused on minutes, only on minutes, and just in these states. Um, I, personally, was in my um, capital. Last week, I went with Playworks. Um, and I was in my capital, and we talked to our new Secretary of Education, Tony Thurman, and um, who now has a copy of my book, which was really like one of the most exciting things to happen out of that trip is that my book is now sitting on his bookshelf. And um, you know, he was interested. He had never thought about, he's our Secretary of Education, and he had never thought about anything having to do with recess legislation. And he was interested and open to thinking about it. Um, so it just goes to show you that your policymakers are not always your content experts. And you have to understand something about child development to understand why recess is so important. And if your policymakers are not schooled in that way, um, you need to educate them um, because otherwise they're not going to know. Okay, that's it on access. Any questions before I move on to withholding? Okay. So. When you talk to teachers, elementary teachers, and you say, you know, why do you withhold recess? They'll tell you, recess is the only time of day that my kids care about. It's the only credible threat that I have. And so they use recess withholding as what they perceive to be the only way that they can keep their kids behaving during class time. Um, has anybody had any experience with recess withholding for themselves or their children or in their research sites or anything like that? <laughs> Yeah, everyone seems to have an experience with it. It's interesting because um, it's such a prevalent practice, and yet when I looked for any kind of literature to support it as um, a efficacious practice, I was unable to find even one study that has any information showing that it's an effective way of, um, of um, getting young children to behave the way we want them to. There is actually no research demonstrating the effectiveness of recess withholding at all. Um, and we and, and part of that is because there is no research on it. Um, it's not that it shows that it's ineffective. It's just that there's nothing out there. It's not demonstrated as a best practice in any way, shape, or form. And yet, we so commonly believe that it's the only way to go that it's almost like a word of mouth practice. You know, one of these things like an old wives tale that you just hear it, so you believe it. Oh yeah, that makes sense. If I withhold recess, then they're going to do what I want. Um, and we never think to turn it around and say, what if I incentivize with recess? What if instead of withholding recess, I say, you can have an extra recess, right? We never turn it around that way, and yet why not, right? If recess is the only thing they care about, why punish with taking it away? Instead, why not incentivize, um, incentivize with it? With it. Um, so I was thinking about it. These are in um, the 12 schools that, um, the control schools from my randomized control experiment, um, we counted um, in these schools, we counted um, how many recesses that we observed with children sitting out. Now, I just want to caveat this. A lot of schools have detention rooms, and if kids were sitting in detention rooms, we were not invited into those spaces, and we didn't see them. So in half the recesses that we physically observed, there were 36 of them in those 12 schools, across those 12 schools, and half of them, there were children sitting out um, that we could see. Probably it was more than that. So half the recesses. On one day, we were at one school. Um, we went there, and we're outside waiting um, for the kids to come out. This kindergarten was coming out first from the lunchroom, and we waited, and we waited, and we waited, and we waited, and not one kindergartner came out. We were at that school for literally one day, only to observe recess. And on that day, the lunch monitor decided to hold in every single kindergartner. These are five-year-olds, five- and six-year-olds. Every single kindergartner from, from recess because of behavioral issues. The kids were not behaving the way this lunch monitor wanted them to, and so no child got recessed that day. And that just tells you, you know, we were there, they knew we were there, the researchers from Stanford are here to observe recess, 
They knew we were there, and yet that, that practice must be so common that they didn't even think twice about doing it, even on the day that the external people were there to observe. Um, so that just tells you this is not isolated, that a whole class can be withheld because of the behavioral problems of just a few. Um, and that it's so prevalent, you know, and the lunch monitors, you know, I know they're good people, but they don't know the kids as well. They don't know what happened in the classroom that morning. You know, maybe something bad was going on. Maybe there was a fight in the class. Maybe there was a good reason why the kids were extra rowdy that day. And what they needed was recess um, instead of being held inside. Um, they're sort of out of context making these decisions. Um, Three quarters of the schools nationwide, according to some research, research allow teachers to withhold recess as punishment. Um, and even when they're, um, even when it's not allowed, teachers are still sometimes doing it. It's really, it's really prevalent. Um, it's not an evidence-based practice. Um, I just told you the story about how um, a whole class can have recess withheld. But one of the things that we learned about withholding is that when you're out at recess, and if you study recess, you know this, it's often the same kids over and over again that are having problems at recess. So it's not usually like, you're not, it's not like a random, random selection of kids, like one day it's this kid and one day it's this kid. It's often the same kids over time that are having problems at recess. If you talk to principals, they'll say, yes, this kid's in my office all the time. They get referred from recess all the time. Um, and so, those kids have recess withheld repeatedly. So think about it. Um, we know in school discipline, the children most likely to be disciplined in schools, we know this from federal data, are um, young boys of color. They have the highest rates of school discipline in elementary school, um, also um, and Native American boys too. And if those are the kids who are having recess withheld constantly, which I believe that they probably are, um, those are the kids who are being told over and over and over again, you don't belong. You don't belong in this space. You can't socialize with the other children. And um, we're going to isolate you. So if you were told over and over and over again, as your brain was developing, that you don't belong, you can't socialize with other children, and you can't be, you have to be isolated in this space, would you begin to believe that? You would. You would begin to believe that. These are authority figures telling you that. And so what we're doing in a way that we're not even recognizing, that we can't even see, is we're setting some of our most vulnerable children on the path to the school to prison pipeline just by withholding recess. So the school to prison pipeline, if you're not familiar with that term, is something that we use in education and sociology where we're saying at very young ages our institutions are treating our children like criminals. And we're telling them that they, that, they, that they should be treated like criminals, that they're engaging in criminal activity. So we're isolating them and telling them they don't belong. They internalize that, and then it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? And then they end up on that pathway. I really believe that withholding recess is the first step onto the school to prison pipeline. Maybe the second step, because I think the first step is probably when we um, expel children from preschool. So the second step is when we withhold recess from them. And, you know, I'm not trying to be alarmist here, but um, I really believe that this is true. And I think teachers, if they understood that, would be, um, would really be, um, change their practices. I think that we've just ingrained this withholding recess so deeply into the way that we do school that people are even unaware of how they could be harming children when they're doing it. So I feel like I want to stand at the rooftops and, and, and say, this is something we should outlaw. We need to come up with other ways to discipline children. And for the children who are having with recess withheld over and over and over again, those are probably the kids who need it the most, right? And they need that opportunity to be with their peers, to gain those social and emotional skills so that they can go on to be successful when they get to middle school and when they get to high school. If we've denied them the opportunity to learn those skills, then we're telling them, you know, we're, 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 we're tying a hand behind their back and we're saying we, we're only giving you half of what you need to get to be successful. So me personally, I think it's really problematic. Um, so there are currently a total of nine states that, um, that say that recess um, cannot be used as punishment. And what's interesting is that it's not just the ones that have recess that are required. It's actually split among states that have recess required, those that have physical activity required, and those that have neither. Um, so three in each, in each bucket, the, the bar on the left is the um, withholding recess. One of the other things that the CDC and Shape America looked at was um, whether or not physical activity is being used as punishment 
So instead of withholding recess, are people making kids run laps for punishment? Um, and they actually found that that was um, slightly more prevalent. There are a total of 12 states that allow that, um, that disallow that, and all the other ones allow it still. Um, I actually have never seen a case of um, physical activity being used for punishment. Have you ever seen that? Have you seen it? Not, not in the school day. You haven't seen it in the school day? Yeah. Yeah, so maybe you were punished. You have to go run a lap if you're... I ran so much. Yeah. <laughs> I want to shot. Yeah. So, um, so that may or may not happen during recess time. Um, I think it's interesting that more states are willing to say you cannot punish with physical activity than are willing to say um, you cannot punish by withholding physical activity, right? Um, and it's, again, not the same states. It's different states doing this. Um, and then, of course, most states have no policy at all. Um, on this topic. So, you know, if you were going to advocate for one thing at your, at your kid's public school or your grandchild's public school or your, you know, the schools where your siblings are at, if you were going to advocate for two things, I would advocate for more recess and I would advocate for this. Do not allow teachers to withhold recess for any reason. There has to be an alternative. Um, and if that's getting aids for kids or other things, um, that should be done. So the biggest problem we have in making the case for these two things, um, for the first two things that I was telling you about, about the opportunity gap and about withholding recess, is that we have no data. There are no national data collections on these topics. And um, we, you know, all of the data that we have are based on small surveys, on samples. Um, even the national data collections that exist are idiosyncratic, and you can't break them down by the kind of groups that you'd like to break them down by. We're really, we just do not have any information on how much recess is provided, whether it's provided consistently. We don't know anything about whether there are policies and practices for withholding. We know almost nothing about students' experiences with having recess withheld. I actually think that would be a fascinating study. I have not seen any literature at all, retrospective or current, thinking about how having recess withheld um, affects the way students think about themselves. If anybody is sort of thinking about that from a public health perspective, that would be a huge contribution to this field. What happens when you're when you have recess withheld? You could do that like among adults, right, and ask them about their elementary experiences. I think it might be traumatic to ask a kid who's in the process of having recess withheld about it. But if you did it retrospective, student like even among college students, you know, you could do a study on campus even here asking people about their experiences with resource withholding um, and generate, uh, you know, that would be a fascinating first look at that topic. I bet you could get that published. Um, if anyone wants to talk to me about it, feel free. <laughs> um, maybe we could do it together. I could do it at UCSC and you guys could do it here and we could see about it. Um, and then, you know, like I said, there's no studies at all looking at the effectiveness question. We just don't know anything about it. And so what we really need is if we're going to track equity, if we're going to make this opportunity gap um, argument, we have to track it. And the data out there, the mechanisms exist to do this, we're just not using them. So the US Department of Education has the Office of Civil Rights Data Collection. Everything we know about disparities in education comes from that data collection. Schools are mandated to report certain things every year. So everything we know about whether schools are offering AP classes or um, about school discipline and who's being disciplined, everything we know is in that data collection. And at the time that I wrote the book, I was like, we need to expand that data collection. It's got to include recess. And then literally, like the week after the book came out, um, the Trump administration announced that they were cutting back on that data collection. Um, and so I'm not sure my vision of including all of these um, metrics to add to that data collection will be realized in the short term. Um, but I think, you know, again, like standing at the rooftops, um, screaming as loud as I can, this is an important time of day and we need to be able to say what's happening at this time of day um, from a federal level. We need parents to be able to look on their school dashboard and find out what's happening at recess, right? We need parents to be able to say, okay, I'm thinking about this school, I'm thinking about this school, recess is so, you talk to parents, the parents are like, recess is so important to my child, right? Do I want my child to go to the school where they allow withholding of recess, or do I want my child to go to the school where they don't allow withholding of recess, right? Like parents should be able to make those decisions for themselves, um, and it should be, we should have all that information for every school. And if we really put it out there, we might change practice, because I think schools would be reluctant to tell you that's one of the punishment mechanisms that they use. Yeah. 
Um, so again, we need more. Okay. So many schools do have recess. Sometimes they're short, but many schools do have recess. And um, like my advisor who asked me why I study recess, isn't it like always amazing everywhere you go? I kind of went into it thinking it's probably pretty good. I mean, kids have fun at recess, right? Like that's the time of day when they have fun. And where my kids went to elementary school, recess actually looked pretty good. I was involved in the school and, um, and so I was getting involved with Playworks around the time that my kids were maybe fourth, fifth grade, sixth grade. And so I was thinking, well, it's usually like, I know there's social dynamic and stuff that happens, but it's usually pretty fun for the kids. And, um, and I was really shocked when I went to go observe my first school um, at how, even with a recess intervention program, how bad recess can be and what a terrible developmental space it can be for children. I was truly blown away. Um, having studied children and families in poverty for many, many years, I just really didn't expect to see the things that I saw. Um, so I'm going to give you, these are quotes from the field notes that my teams took um, when we were observing recess. And I just, you know, we have, I have like piles and piles and piles and piles of data. Um, but I just took three to sort of demonstrate what recess is like. So the top one on the left says there was a negative vibe to this whole recess. There was physical activity in spurts, but it was mainly to run away from being punched and tackled. So if you put pedometers on the kids, you might actually see them getting their steps in, but was it a positive, supportive environment? No, they were punching each other, tackling each other, running away from each other. Um, the time that students were out on the yard was short, about 10 minutes, but that time was full of bullying and negative play. So there wasn't really much positive happening at that school. At another school, um, our observer was thinking, this looks pretty good. There's this basketball game going, and the kids are really engaged. And then there was an argument over who got to do something with the ball, put it in, take it out, whatever it is. And they couldn't get past it. And the whole game got derailed because they had no mechanism to figure out something as simple as who gets the ball, right? And that's like a key part of the game. Who gets to take the ball in is part of the game. And if you can't agree on that, you'll never get to play the game. And that's exactly what happened. The whole game was derailed. Even though they had the equipment, they had the space, they had the teams, they were playing, it all abruptly ended after five minutes and they just fought the rest of the time. And they were arguing still when they went back into school. Like they didn't get over it during recess. So they didn't get over it during recess and then what happened, they were upset when they got into class, right? And then who's helping them to get over that? Their teacher. So the teacher's now spending five, 10, 15 minutes helping kids who are really upset about what happened at recess to calm them down, to transition them back into learning mode. Um, you know, they could spend any amount of time doing that. Um, and then the third one was sort of in between. There's nothing bad happening. Uh, recess has very little structure and the kids are running a lot. Very few are playing games beyond like what might be a massive game of tag. So there wasn't terrible stuff happening there, but there wasn't really good stuff happening there either. You know, they were running around, they probably would have gotten their steps on their pedometer, but they weren't really engaged in play. And, you know, play is that learning opportunity. You have to be interacting with kids to be building those social and emotional skills. That's how it happens. And if it's, if it's not set up to support play, then you're not going to generate those results. And so at the recesses that I've observed, there's actually a lot of stuff happening that makes me think that, you know, it's just not, um, not all it can be. And a lot of my findings mirror things that Will has found. This one, he I was just reading one of his papers the other day, and you know, he has a whole um, story about adults also. Um, and the role of adults at recess is incredibly important. So at most schools, um, recess is monitored by what we call paraprofessionals. So they're not teachers, um, and they're not trained counselors. Usually it's people from the community, it could be the crossing guard who does double duty, it could be an after school provider, it could be just like, you know, someone's grandma, or it could be one of the neighbors from around the neighborhood. They're usually untrained people, um, not paid particularly great wages, um, kept at a level of hours just below the level that they would need to accrue time for professional development or benefits, um, and it's usually hourly paid. And those are the people who are um, monitoring recess. And so they're often untrained 
and the job description says recess monitor, which is really just about make sure the kids are safe. There's really never anything in a recess monitor job description that is about engaging with kids or playing with kids. Sometimes they do, but it's not really part of their job description. And so when you stand on a recess yard, you see everything from people engaged with children and playing to people standing, talking to their friends or on their phones, adults, to adults who are like full on mean and yelling at children. Raise your hand if you've ever seen a child yell at a, an adult yell at a child on a recess yard. Yes. Um, and so we could be doing better. We could be doing better there, right? We could be doing a lot better. And those relationships that kids build with adults at school are incredibly important for their development. Um, incredibly important. And that's an opportunity for a person who a child sees every single day at school, those recess monitors might be the only people in the whole school who see every kid every day, right? They might know every single kid's name at the whole school, and they would possibly be the only person who does. They have a really important role, and yet we're not giving them any training, we're not giving them any responsibility, um, and we're not telling them what our expectations are for engagement with kids. And so what do we expect? Two lunch monitors walk around, occasionally engage with kids, tell them to clean up, and largely ignore the bullying and running around that's happening. Um, there was one kid punching another kid in front of an adult, and he did nothing. Um, we saw uh, another, um, another case where the kids who played tap, there was a game that a monitor, you know, she came up with, and the kids who were playing with her had a great time, and they were engaged, and then she would go off and do something else, and they would stop playing. But it just shows you how important having an adult on the yard to play with because as soon as she came back into the game, she had a crowd of kids around her who wanted to play that game with her. Um, and so she was really able to generate play, even though she wasn't like a Playworks coach or anything, just by being someone who wanted to engage with kids. Um, and we saw, you know, we saw monitors yelling at kids, take off your shoe and quit whining, you know, or put your shoe on and quit whining, whatever it says. What's the problem? Take that shoe off and quit whining. Um, and so sometimes the kids are afraid of the yard monitors um, and they don't want to go to them with their problems because they know they're going to get yelled at. We saw, um, you know, conflict and discipline on the play yard can be a really big issue and I've seen some really crazy, um, really crazy violent things that are, have happened on playgrounds. The worst thing we ever saw was a terrible fight that broke out between two fourth grade boys. Um, on asphalt and you could, the way it's described, you could hear the child's head banging on the asphalt. I wasn't there, it was um, one of my colleagues uh, did the field notes for that. And um, you know, the, one of the monitors just like never got off the bench during that whole episode. I mean, that's just not right. So we need to really think hard about what the adults are doing if we're gonna do something better. And so what I refer to is an organized recess. So in the recess world, if you say a structured recess, you're saying a dirty word. A structured recess is a bad thing. It implies like a PE class where there's children don't have choice and there's no agency, where everybody's doing the same activity at the same time. So we don't want to say the press loves that word structured. And every time they say structured, I cringe because to the free play people, that means something specific. Then there's unstructured play, this whole free play movement where um, there's this argument that children are gonna learn and grow best if we don't intervene at all. We have no equipment. We maybe throw some found objects like wooden crates or big tires into the play yard and we see what happens. And that may be great in some environments, but you know, I was just telling um, Will and his research team, in inner city Philadelphia where I've been, like you put a wooden crate in the middle of a schoolyard and that is not gonna be fun times. <laughs> it is not. And so, you know, what's the in between? And, and the way it's set up in the literature is like a dichotomy. You're either structured or you're free play. And why can't you have both? Like why does it have to be one or the other? I feel like if you organize a good recess, you could have elements of both those things coexisting, and so kids can get their needs met at the same time. Some kids want and need to run around and play soccer or basketball. That's what they want to do at recess. That's phenomenal. Set them up so they can run that game and let them go. Some kids can't do that or won't do that because they're afraid to join in. They're not as good at soccer. So you have to tweak things a little bit Play art has to be inclusive, or there has to be another game of soccer that everybody else can join. 
Some kids want to do imaginary play. Phenomenal. Imaginary play is wonderful. There's a whole area for it over here. If you're going to jump rope, don't jump rope in the middle of the basketball court because that's unsafe and the kids who are playing basketball are going to hit you in the head with their ball and you're going to get a concussion or you're going to rope them as you're trying to jump rope, right? So to make sure everything has its own place is really a starting point. And I feel like if schools, if all they did was get their play yard organized so that every game had its own space and the kids could agree on the rules to those games, and they understood how to resolve a conflict, like the ball is in, the ball is out, or something like that. If we did only those three things, that recess everywhere would be a ton better. It would not be perfect, but it would be eons better. So when I talk to schools that are just starting out, how can we fix recess? Those are the three things I recommend. Go look at your play yard. What do your kids like to play at this school? Make sure those games are available and there's equipment for them in their own places. What are the rules they like? I had this example um, at a school that I went to. Um, Foursquare was the big game there. You know, Foursquare, it's like there's a box and there's four squares and you have a ball and you bounce it into the other square and the kid has to bounce it back. And as you advance, you end up standing in the square here, which is the king or the queen square. Okay, and so the way that this game had been played at that school was that um, whoever was in the king or the queen square got to make the rules for the game. So there's like a thousand different ways to play four square. There's like double bounce and single bounce and in bounce and out bounce and whatever. Um, and so the kid and the king or queen made the rules. Well, what kind of rules are they gonna make? Right, they're gonna make rules that benefit themselves. So whatever they're most, they're, whatever they're best at, those were the rules that they made. And it was used as a way of excluding other children from joining the game, right? So only the kids that could agree and knew how to play those rules and were really good at those rules got to play Foursquare. Everyone else got out right away. So that was very frustrating. Um, Playworks came in and they said, you know what? We're going to do away with that and we're going to have common school rules. Everyone's going to play by these rules. Nobody's going to stand in this box and make the rules. Well, there was an uproar. Who do you think that uproar was from? The parents. The parents calling the school. You are ruining recess. You are ruining recess for my child by doing this. Really. It even made it into the newspaper. I'm not joking. So they said, fine. You know what we're going to do? We're going to have two four score courts. And we're going to mark them. So the one with the existing rules, that was called the old school rules. And there was an old school rules court. And then there was a new four square court. That was the Playworks rules. And kids could pick. You like that rules? Play there. You like these rules? Play here. What do you think happened? By the end of the year, everybody wanted to have the common rules, except for maybe the four kids who liked controlling that four square game. And then they could play by themselves. And that was fine. Um, and so it just shows you that you know the culture of the school really matters. And you can't, you have to take into, into account what it is the kids are playing and how they like to play. If you just go in and you say, we're changing everything, you're likely to be unsuccessful, people are very entrenched in the way that they do things, you really have to take the pulse of the school and figure out what's happening there in order to be able to make changes that are gonna be really meaningful. I mean, that's a silly example about Foursquare, but if you're a kid who likes to play Foursquare and you wanna play it at recess every day, that's a huge big change. It's a huge big change that could make you feel really differently about yourself as a player in that game now that it's fair. Um, one of the things that, I, that, um, that Playworks does that I think is really good is they um, centralize the equipment checkout. So in a lot of elementary schools, the teachers hold on to the balls and jump ropes and stuff, and then as the kids are going out, they let them take it out. So I was at a school um, where that was the practice, and the teacher had a basketball. This basketball was coveted. Everybody wanted this basketball. So if it was your day with the basketball, you were like the class hero. So I was at recess one day, and there's this kid walking around holding a basketball like this but for 15 minutes. I'm not joking. And I said to one of them, I said to one of the other adults, I'm like, why is that kid holding? Like, why isn't that kid out there playing with that basketball? What is going on? And they were like, oh, that's kids from so-and-so's class, yeah. And so they get to rotate when they take the equipment out. And so today was his day, and so he's holding the basketball. And so it was his day, so he owned the basketball, and so he could say, well, it's my basketball, you can't play with me, right? 
And it was a really ineffective way of sharing equipment because he felt like he could own it. And so if you centralize the equipment, then it's everybody's equipment. And if it's everybody's equipment, then everybody gets to play with it. It doesn't matter if you're the person who checks it out or not. You go, you check out the equipment, you have a basketball, everybody can expect to play with it because it didn't come from your classroom and it wasn't your day to hold it. It was just the basketball that the school has. If you lose that basketball, then everybody's lost the basketball. It's a way of keeping track of the equipment also because um, people feel a little bit more collective um, ownership of it. That's one of the big problems at schools is they lose their equipment by the end of the school year. They get wherever they end up. Um, and so centralizing equipment checkout, I think, is really important. Um, games are inclusive. Anybody can play. Um, that's hard to do in practice, but, um, but I think it's important. And then youth leadership. This is something that Will's been working on a lot, um, and I think it's really important. Um, who knows recess better than the kids who were there? And who knows this, the, the culture and the climate of that community better than the kids who were there? Um, there are very few opportunities for youth leadership in elementary school, and those that exist exist mainly for the kids who are the most academically successful. It's not always the same kids who are good leaders on the play yard who, as, the, as the ones who are good leaders in the classroom. Um, they're often different kids, and sometimes it's nice to give a leadership opportunity to a kid who's a natural leader, sometimes for good and sometimes not for good, on the play yard because it gives them a purpose. If they really want to be the center of activity and they want to run things, and you let them run things, you actually elicit better behavior out of them. You've given them responsibility, you've trained them a little bit, and now they can actually do the job they always wanted to have, which is tell everyone what to do, but they can do it in a positive way where they're not kind of ruling the play yard. I think it's a brilliant strategy, to be honest, and I've seen it work in a lot of different places, and the kids themselves don't seem to notice that's what's happening, um, but it really does change the way that they're behaving, not just on the play yard, but also in their classrooms. Okay, so how do we know if what we're doing is effective? This is one of the things that was plaguing Playworks. How do we know if recess is good or not? And so in comes famous Will Massey to work with Playworks and develop, validate, um, and validate the great recess, fra recess framework, which I'll tell you is a phenomenal tool. Um, I've used it myself on a number of occasions, and it's really, it's a huge innovation in our field um, to have this way of saying, this is what we mean. This is how we know that this recess is there. We have this incredible tool. It's very easy to use. Anybody could do it. You can use it as a baseline assessment. You can use it to track progress over time in the same school. Um, it's a really important tool. And what it does is it lays out 17 items that are within these five categories having to do with safety and structure, adult engagement, student behaviors, transitions to and from recess. I didn't talk very much about that, but that's a big deal, um, and physical activity. Qualitatively, what this means is that adults are engaging in pro-social ways with children um, during recess, that there are games established, that they're inclusive, and that students are engaged, so conflicts are de-escalated. When students are busy playing, they do not have time to engage in fistfights because they are so busy playing basketball um, and enjoying themselves. So um, I told you we did this randomized control trial um, with Mathematica Policy Research. Um, and what we found was that when we have this organized recess, a la Playworks, um, that all things great happen. We have increased levels of um, moderate to vigorous physical activity, especially for girls, that we have um, increased teacher reports of positive interactions and in language, inclusive language, and positive, like, good job, instead of you're out, that kind of stuff. Um, increases in teachers' reporting, reports of student safety, um, and increased in reports of support for organized play in school. Um, this is a surprise we found teachers reporting decreases in bullying, um, which Playworks is not an anti-bullying program. So that, that magnitude, that size, is bigger than any of the effect sizes we've seen of any of the whole anti-bullying literature. Um, so it was just not intended to decrease bullying, but just by giving kids stuff to do, you know, if there's nothing to do at recess and you have a kid who has a tendency, I don't really believe that there are bullies. Like I think there's a lot of stuff happening at home with kids who have behaviors like that where they tend to pick on other kids. But if you have a kid who has those tendencies towards those behaviors and there's nothing else to do, they're going to engage in those behaviors and they're going to get this person and this person and this person to walk around and do it with them because there's nothing else to do. 
if everybody's playing, that's not gonna happen. And so bullying goes down because people are, maybe that one kid is still engaging in those behaviors, but everyone else, all their friends are doing other stuff and they can't be bothered. Um, and so there's just more fun. And then teachers reported that um, the number of minutes to transition back to class went down um, because kids weren't so upset afterwards. Um, so we also see improvements in recess satisfaction, not just for teacher, not just for students, but for teachers. Um, engagement of adults with children, opportunities for youth leadership, and um, some of my research has shown improvements to overall school climate. Um, and again, school climate is one of these areas that people think about as inside classrooms, as opposed to at all the spaces um, where kids exist at school, including recess. So I have a couple implications for policy and practice, and I've said them all along, um, so I think I might not go through them, because I want to show you what's happening um, on your Oregon uh, school dashboard. Um, so in Oregon, there's no mention of recess or social emotional skills or school climate in your accountability dashboards. So I pulled up your dashboard. This is what um, Oregon, this is what the Oregon Department of Education puts out. Um, and um, schools have a lot of, you know, different states do this in different ways. Um, and so, of course, they've got, you know, English language arts and mathematics. Those are important. This is probably new attendance. Chronic absence is now a really big deal in the education world, so that's probably new. Um, but I want to point your attention down to these levels. And I know this is hard to read, so I'm just going to tell you a little bit what it says. Um, um, oh, I can't read that on my computer. I don't have my glasses on. OK, so down here, this says, a safe and welcoming environment. We work hard to make, our, to make school a place where all students and families feel welcome and included. So that's pretty nebulous. <laughs> I mean, what does that mean? We train our front staff. We, right? Like we shovel the drive, the front walkway. Like what, what exactly does that mean? Right? And could we make that a little bit more specific by tying it into recess as an inclusive space? Right? Um, they have bullying, harassment, and safety policies. Portland, this is in Portland. Portland Public Schools. Um, have policies to help schools um, provide safe environments for every student. Could we turn that into something more specifically about recess context? What is it about safety, right? What programs are we operating? How much time are we giving students? How have we trained um, our recess monitors to support school safety, right? Again, this is bullying, harassment, and safety, that's just really nonspecific. What could we do? How could we measure these things at recess and put it in a dashboard like this? They have extracurricular activities, but nothing about recess during the school day. That seems strange. It's not even during the school day, and it's up here. Parent engagement and community engagement. You know, these are sort of catch-all terms now for how inclusive an environment we're providing. And, um, and yet, we're not saying anything about how we're punishing children, how we're supporting them at recess. You know, it's just we're, it's like not even on the radar here. It's not even on their radar at all. So I'm going to leave you with this to just sort of think about, you know, what could we, what are the possibilities for changing state policy um, here in Oregon? And um, in California, when I was up talking with Tony Thurman last week, um, about um, about recess, you know, we had suggestions because our dashboard has a school climate metric on it, and right now the school climate um, indicator that they use on the California dashboard is suspensions and expulsions. That's how we measure school climate. We also have a mandate to decrease suspensions and expulsions, and you know what happened over the past five years? They've gone down. So we must be doing something better. I mean, it's ridiculous. We they told us not to do it anymore, and so teachers aren't doing it anymore, and now they're claiming that it's a big success. Um, but have we changed any behavior at all? Have we changed anything that's involved in the school context to change behavior, or are we just using, you know, we're just not suspending kids anymore, and they just go into in-school um, discipline, right? Like, we, you know, we just don't know. So I think the more specific we can get in our accountability dashboards, the more that we can gain traction to support recess. And I think recess belongs in so many of these categories, including attendance, because we know anecdotally and also from one research study that um, sometimes children come to school just because of recess. And so what's happening there is really important. And believe it or not, 
That was my last slide. Um, it's exactly two o'clock. Um, when I put this um, proposal together, my parents were visiting me. My mom was an elementary school reading teacher, and so I made an acrostic poem for her um, about recess that I will leave you with, um, and then I'll take questions. Are you aware of any difference between public and private schools? Um, my research has all been in public schools, public and charter schools. Um, private schools have even less regulation than public schools. Now, there are some private schools like Waldorf schools, Montessori schools that are school are play-based school. Um, and so those schools I know have really stellar um, recess environments. Um, I would imagine um, parochial schools that are kind of very strict may not have um, as, but I just don't know. That would be a really interesting thing to study, would be to think about um, differences in private and public um, and see what they see what they look like. Um, hi. Hi. Great talk. Super interesting. I'm wondering if you probably know some of this already, this research. I mean, um, my background is developmental psychology, and there's a lot you can, uh, traction to be had for the, um, looking at some of the studies on aggression. Mm -hmm. And if you saw that there was this famous research where they videotaped recess, and they saw there was this um, statistic that like that teachers or monitors see less than 5%. Did you hear about this? It's a famous study okay. from the 90s. Yeah, it's and so I'm just wondering, yeah. in terms of gaining traction at a policy level, it may be useful. There is some research in this in the psychological field, especially around aggression mm -hmm. and bullying, mm -hmm. that you probably already know about. But um, it was shocking, actually, to see a video. I used to show it in one of my classes. Of, um, they just don't see it. They don't see it yeah. at all. And, and you watch, there was like a kid just watching it. He was just getting bullied all over the playground. Mm -hmm. So how these are these horrific times of day for some children. That yeah. Are really vulnerable. And if the, if the adults who were out on the yard were engaged in some of the play with yes. the kids, right. then they would see it. Right. right. You'd be part of the game. Exactly. Yeah. It would be totally a different yeah. story. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Hi. Hi. And I took a foundational martial learning work. And That's why you were in the back nodding the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. So I just, I just wanted to thank you for, for emphasizing that so much in the work around recess, in addition to physical activity and everything else that comes along with recess. I just wanted to plant the seed of a thought for future, looking at World Two, future mm -hmm. collaboration ideas. One of the struggles on the social emotional learning side is that we recognize that everyone with a face, everybody who touches the life of a child needs training and support. Yeah. And, that, and I noticed in the intervention, positive interactions and positive communication was one of the things that came out of this. And it just has made me think, um, and so often the playground monitors and other folks who are there interacting with children are not being paid for social development time. Yep. are not getting that support. And so on the social and emotional learning side, it's really hard for us to make that case about getting everyone to the table when we know that that's really what people need. Yeah. It makes me think that maybe some of the, some of what you're seeing on the recess side could help on both sides. Absolutely. I mean, you know, like I said, people don't think about recess when they're thinking about an SEL intervention. Um, they're just not thinking about recess. It's not because a lot of these interventions are teacher-led or teacher-supported, and because teachers are often taking their lunch at that time, they're just unaware um, of what the what it looks like. Um, some teachers decide they want to go out and support recess, even if it is their lunchtime, just because they want to know what's happening. Um, especially if there's a problem coming back to their classroom, they will. Um, but yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree more. We need to align the in-class with the out-of-class space time, and we need to really be thinking about professional development for everybody who's at school and not just, you know, teachers we know are experts, they've been trained. Um, but, you know, if we're going to have somebody interacting with kids, it should be a little bit more than a fingerprint and a TB test. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm utterly convinced of. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. I'm thrilled. But the one thing that struck me is that, that the solutions for this, I think probably are real. That, Teachers need to be more engaged, better trained, professional development. Certainly more monitors, more engagement in monitors, more equipment that isn't a wooden crate 
those are all fairly resource intensive. Mm -hmm. Is there a danger that the rich schools get richer and the very schools that would benefit the most from this don't have the resources to implement that? Uh, yeah. Where do we go with that? Yeah, absolutely. And so if you, if you, you know, look on my list, the first couple of things that I have on my list are things that are not resource intensive. So um, the first couple of things are have games that have common rules and are set up in predictable spaces. So take advantage of what's already being played and make it a little bit better. The next thing is each game has its own space. There's free choice. There's space for creative and imaginary games. And then equipment is centralized. Like that's the first time that we get to something that you would have money, that you need money for. The rest of it, you just really need um, commitment. And that's just as hard to get in a school. Everybody in the school environment is busy. Every last person has zero free time. And so, you know, who's going to own, who's going to own this? Um, is it going to be the principal? The principal has a million different things. They cannot be out at recess every day because they have district meetings and they have other things going on. They're sitting in their office disciplining kids. So who's going to own it? That's the hardest thing at the school. And um, that's not a money issue. That's a time issue. Um, so what Playworks does is they put a coach, or one of their models is they put a coach in the school, and the school pays a certain amount and they fundraise the other half of it. And um, what they found is that it's not sustainable. It works great, and the schools love it, and they love having a really high energy, energetic person out there, and yet they can't afford to spend the money on it every year. And so you know, what can we do to help schools own this on their own? Um, maybe we could do some coaching, some training, um, but ultimately somebody at the school has to own it. And that's, I, some of it's a money problem, but some of it's just that. Mm -hmm. I sort of see like that missing from this discussion when in reality physical education the content area is carried out absolutely the recess field if they don't have the requisite skills to participate in the yep. they will not and or they will it will be a very unpleasant experience and I think and if we look at the comprehensive school physical activity plan that's who own you know we try to like with our future teachers, you are the champion of that, mm -hmm. and part of that model is the, the, the recess time. So I see it's like, this is a, a really good relationship, mm -hmm. but I don't, I, you know, you don't, I, and this is new, right? And yeah. I understand, so it's like us kind of employing the physical educators, this is your space, this is your lab. Yeah. Right? You know, I totally agree with you. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, what I was trying to focus on in this book was to elevate recess to the status that PE often has, right? For PE, we have standards, we have curriculum, we have minutes, which makes it a really important space. And if there's alignment between what's happening at PE and what's happening at recess, I think both of them are elevated to a new level. Um, but recess is just not, I mean, like PEC on recess is like here, you know, people just are not thinking about it. So my goal in this book was to help us get it up there. Um, but I think that I think you're absolutely right that there is this incredible alignment and synergy that could be um, you know to get kids up to the skill level that they need to teach them to teach them the rules, right? right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're going to establish common rules. Who's going to teach them those rules? Well, a PE teachers trained to do that. So that would be phenomenal to get the PE teacher involved. I've been to schools where the PE teacher has been the biggest champion of uh, recess reform, and I've been to schools where the PE teacher tries to thwart it at every stop. Um, and I think it, there's like personality things that come into play. I don't know if you've had that same experience um, where you see both. Well, I would say the, the biggest problem we see, particularly in urban areas, is most schools don't have their own PE teacher. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. So they're, they're four schools, and yeah. then they can't own recess because yeah. they have to go to another school. Right. Yeah, and in my, where my kids went to elementary school, and in a lot of California, we don't have PE teachers for elementary. It's the classroom teacher teaching PE, and so like that wouldn't really be an option anyway because they don't know. This is actually funny. My daughter, when she was in sixth grade, went back to volunteer in her second grade teacher's class as like one of her service hours, whatever, and her second grade teacher was pregnant, and so she had my sixth grader, who was, what, 12, running PE for her <laughs> because she was pregnant and she couldn't move around. So there's not a whole lot of professional development that goes into the PE programs, at least in the area where I live. Yeah, yeah unfortunately. Well, I think they t 
sometimes the administration sort of pits them against each other. Well, we have recess, so we don't need PE. You know, like the minutes are gotten. It's like, no, 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 they don't. It's their right, time. exactly. They're serving different purposes, yeah. right? Um, and, you know, it's like social and emotional learning. It's the same kind of thing. You're learning a skill in a more structured environment that you then can practice in a less regulated environment. And that practice time is equally as important as the learning time, right? You can't, you can't learn anything unless you have a chance to practice it in a real world setting. And so they need both. And if they can be, you know, in the book I say like, any intervention you have going on at your school should also be at recess. Like any school climate, any PBIS, any social emotional learning, anything you have happening, character development, anything that's going on at the school should be brought explicitly into the recess venue because that's where the kids are going to practice it. If you're doing kindness or you're doing caring or you're doing whatever this month, how are you doing that at recess? Like make it explicit for them. Let them see that this is an important time of day too. And also how are you doing it on the school bus? How are you doing it in the hallways? How are you doing it before school, right? Um, it's all these other spaces that school climate's built, and it's the place where it can be completely brought down to. Yeah. We should think about how to collaborate on that. That would be fun. Yeah. Questions, comments, concerns? Next steps? Careers? <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thank you.